Ben, thank you so much for your time. Really looking forward to uh, kind of picking your brain a little bit. Um, for the listeners at home, will you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your motivation, um, and where you are currently? Sure, yeah. Um, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me on the podcast today. It's my first podcast, so I'm looking forward to discussing all things research and skill acquisition with you. Mm. So I think it's best to start with our motivations, really. So I'm really motivated to help coaches develop adaptive athletes and create knowledge on how learning environments can be designed to accelerate skill acquisition and the development of talent. So this stems from my own interests and experiences in golf. I experienced firsthand as a teenager how research and technology can be applied to accelerating skill acquisition and improving performance. So I'm a sports scientist by training and completed an undergraduate, so a BSc here in the UK, uh, and a master's, so an MSc in sport and exercise science at Sheffield Hallam University. Hmm. under the supervision of Dr. Joseph Stone and Professor Keith Davis. So there's the skill acquisition researchers in our centre. Uh, yeah, so I carried that interest forward really into uh, doing a PhD and I'm currently enrolled in a PhD programme within the skill acquisition research theme within hmm. the Centre for Sports Engineering Research at Sheffield Hallam University. And for my PhD, I'm investigating on how parkour style training can be utilised as a donor sport for developing athleticism in team sport players. Hmm. Okay, so that's that's kind of what really uh, drew me to kind of reach out to you, right? So um, I'm very interested in like action sports, parkour, breakdancing, things like that. So what kind of uh, drew you to to write this article that you wrote? And will you mention the name of it as well? Yeah, so the article, I've got it up here. So the title of the article is Parkour as a Donor Sport for Athletic Development in Youth Team Sports. Mm-hmm. Insights through an ecological dynamics lens. So this article's open access online. Mm-hmm. So if the listeners just Google the title, mm-hmm. they can get free access to the PDF from the journal website. Uh, that's one thing we really wanted to do with this article is get it out to as many coaches as possible mm-hmm. and make research as accessible as possible. Because that's yeah. really, really what we're what our mission statement is really to you know create new knowledge and advance practice. Yeah, and and I'll throw that so, in the show notes as well. Yep. Yeah. Definitely, I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you it through. Um, so, in terms of what gave me the idea for the article, mm-hmm. so it's kind of a story in itself. So, okay. way back in uh, 2016, uh, I met one of the co-authors of the paper, Pavel van der Steen. Okay. And he came over from the Netherlands mm-hmm. uh, to undertake a visiting research position at the university. Mm-hmm. So I hit off with hit it off with Pavel straight away because we're both grounded in the same theoretical camp, so the contemporary approaches to talent development. Uh, and Powell were a high-level parkour coach and athlete. Mm. So it's got listening to Powell talking about parkour and watching him do some of the movements. So um, they used to do some jumping and rolling on the uh, benches outside mm. uh, where we used to sit and have a coffee. So me and Powell got talking to the professor in our centre, Keith Davis, who's head of the school acquisition theme within the research centre, mm-hmm. about how concepts of affordances, so invitations for action in the environment, could overlap between parkour and team sports. Mm-hmm. So we integrated these ideas into like a pilot study at a local football club mm-hmm. and really adapted our understanding of the concepts behind that. So, you know, the overlap of affordances, uh, the, adaptive, the adaptability of the environment, how can we manipulate constraints in the environment, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, and really advanced our theoretical ideas and put them in, a posi- in the position paper. Yeah, but one of the main things I like to I get asked this a lot of conferences. They said, Ben, you know, you say you uh, want to prescribe parkour uh, training, but is parkour dangerous? And mm. I don't want my kids <laughs> jump buildings or jumping over uh, railway carriages. Yeah. And I must admit, before I met Powell, my preconceived understanding of what parkour parkour was was a high risk sport that involved jumping over buildings and doing flips <laughs> and tricks in the air and all that sort of stuff. But after speaking with Powell and yeah. the parkour community in general, it's far from that. And uh, actually, the activities which we put in the paper mm. uh, are proposed to be scaled down relative to uh, the performer's age or skill level. Okay. So you're, you're taking the danger away from that, really, because yeah. it's scaled relative to their own abilities. Mm. And it's built, so parkour overall is built off a guy called, well, a philosopher called jo- uh, George Herbert. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, I always put this on my PowerPoints, and he said, this, well, his philosophy is for training, so training basic movement skills. Mm-hmm. An athlete or individual uh, has to be strong to be useful mm-hmm. and be uh, and to last. Mm-hmm. So 
really develop the versatile adaptive mover before the athlete can become an expert. Mm, okay. But that, and it's these ideas really that we just thought, you know, it's a waste to just talk about them over, over coffee. We need to get them out there. And, yeah. uh, and, and it's been well received by, it's got a, quite a wide readership and I'm, I'm really pleased with it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so without, without Powell, uh, I don't think I would have uh, had the practical <laughs> insights into parkour has been it's been great for great for the development of the project so far yeah no that that that's really difficult as far as um reaching out to that kind of community so for you to have access for someone like that that's that's huge you know and that's huge for the article and for your learning and and for the rest of the coaches that are learning from this right um yeah. so kind of moving into this so i read the article um but for those who who haven't read the article yet so would you define what donor sport kind of refers to yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I do get asked this question a lot uh, as well because it's a relatively uh, new concept. So mm-hmm. um, basically, the donor sport concept is from this great book uh, by Rennie Vermont and colleagues. Mm-hmm. So my, one of my professors, Keith Davis, is an author on the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you readers, uh, readers, if the listeners are interested, I'm uh, interested in talent development and athletic skill. I would really recommend reading this book. It's it's a uh, it's it's great. So to just get into what donor sports are then. So donor mm-hmm. sports uh, are activities that share general and specific movement repertoires required to perform well in an athlete's main target sport. Mm-hmm. So in an, in essence, donor sports uh, donor sport activities facilitate the transfer of skill mm-hmm. between practice domains. And one of the key concepts is and the key understandings is the donor sport because of the overlap of skills between practice domains integrating them into practice could be particularly useful when a skill is missing or considered under development in an athlete's movement repertoire. So mm. uh, if they're not developing uh, cutting maneuvers, for instance, or, or balance or lack of agility, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Okay. And what was, the, what was the title of that book again? Uh, the Athletic Skills Model. Mm. Okay. Uh, and just to, add, just to add that, so uh, I always put, what does a donor sport look like? Because mm. obviously it's a concept, so I'd like to... Uh, you know, substantiate it. So the athletic skills model, uh, it recommends that the choice of donor sport must provide an environment that is varied mm-hmm. and that enables exploration and innovative movement solutions to task goals. So mm-hmm. it allows an athlete to uh, move freely without any, um, you know, interference from instruction or the coach. Mm. Okay, so by by that definition, then, for example, so track and field could be a donor sport for like a team sport then, correct? Yeah, yeah, because okay. it's got you know you've got the transfer of uh, you, you know the perception action coupling the limbs. You've got um, spatial awareness by staying in the lanes. You know, in in a race, you've got to couple your movements with your uh, with the um, who you're racing against, so you don't bump into them. Mm-hmm. All that sort of stuff. And you know, I've got I've wrote down uh, just in my in my show notes some examples which are which I think are interesting. Mm-hmm. So um, the main one, and I don't know if you follow uh, follow soccer. Mm, but, yeah, uh, Zatlan Ibrahimovic mm-hmm. in its early years was a, a really high level taekwondo athlete. Ah, okay. And um, there's clips on YouTube which yeah. I really draw inspiration from when I'm trying to show a, a, an example. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you see some of the goals he scores from the kicks, yeah, the leg movements, they and you get a picture of a taekwondo kick, they're mirrored, and yeah. it's really great to see the donor sport concept. In action, yeah, yeah, uh, and, in, and in applied setting where you won't usually, uh, you won't usually think about seeing it. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, even to yep. to add to that, I mean, watching his goal, he he made a goal from from near midfield, right? And that's that yeah. makes a lot more sense now, you know. Yeah, he's a he, what could say he is an innovative and adaptive athlete. He works within his own movement system. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, there's been there's been a one paper apart from ours in donor sports uh, by colleagues in Portugal. Mm-hmm. I can link it in the show notes. Where, uh, where I can send you a copy to link in the show notes. Yeah. And so that futsal is uh, donor sport for football because mm. of the shared movement characteristics between passing skill and then you know during the one on one environments you know mm-hmm. we call them dads. Yeah. In Scott position. Okay. So that's uh, that's what's out there and some examples yeah. to contextualize the ideas for the uh, for the listeners. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that, and so I guess I guess donor sports have been around for a while. We just haven't necessarily had a had a title for that, right? Because you yeah. s- you see a lot of high level athletes with multiple sport backgrounds. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. You said that because uh, speaking to uh, well, we had a meeting in our research theme mm-hmm. earlier this week, and 
one of the big things that we're interested in uh, within the Scar Acquisition Research team at Sheffield Allen mm. is experiential knowledge of coaches and, and sampling their because the experiential knowledge of coaches, if you sample it, it's so rich and mm-hmm. you get such a rich understanding of concepts Yeah. Um, in terms of learning design, in terms of how they approach practice, all mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. Mm. And what you find is, yeah, coaches have been um, integrating these sort of concepts into practice for a very long time. Mm-hmm. They just haven't, uh, the theories or the researchers that have been, haven't been there to articulate it. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's great, you know, uh, I'm a real big advocate, and I think I get this from my supervisors, of, mm. you know, not just doing lab studies, not just doing interventions, getting data and prescribing it that way. I really like to work with coaches mm. um, to develop practices that, you know, are, are theoretically sound, but also practically relevant. Mm. Yeah. There's no there's no point um, saying you know I've got this three dimensional data from this athlete and it proves that if you if you do this practice task you you become a better mover. Yeah. If that can't be integrated with a coach's you know rich understanding uh, rich understanding and their knowledge of practice, mm. then it's not it's not really worthwhile. And that goes back to really my motivations of mm. you know creating a, a breadth of understanding of of research that can improve you know my understanding as a researcher yeah. but also you know, apply practice. Mm, okay. So let's take out of a, a step away from the article and, and let's look at everything from like a, a 40,000 foot view, right? So yep. how could we redesign um, youth sports to kind of include parkour in kind of the contemporary setting? Uh, okay. So, uh, it's a great question. And um, I've got a paper coming out within the next couple of months what addresses mm. this. Mm. So I'll, uh, I'll give your listeners a little bit of an insight into, okay. into what was said in that paper. Yeah. Uh, but should be with you by the end of 2019, but okay. it depends on the review process. Yeah. So I sampled um, the experiential knowledge of expert or experienced parkour coaches. I thought, you know, mm-hmm. it's really these these guys and uh, are really uh, interesting. You know, I've observed how they do design learning environments. You know, outdoors, uh, but I want to know how they can be integrated into team sport practice. Mm-hmm. So the general principle I found is that the parkour style training has to be scaled relative to their abilities but also the task in hand Mm -hmm. so it has to exploit something we call uh, like cognitive appraisal so Mm -hmm. an athlete's um like perceived ability Mm -hmm. relative to their you know actual ability Mm -hmm. okay it caught like if if we're looking at for instance um scaling down the the jumping task from um, you know, in an urban environment, jumping between two walls. Mm-hmm. If the gap, if the uh, you know the kid or the um, the athlete perceives the gap to be too big, they'll not make the jump because you know they'll they'll hurt themselves. Yeah. If if you can you know if you can just get that balance point between you know I can't make this jump or I can I might be able to make this jump, the chances are they're going to take the risk and mm-hmm. and you know step up to the challenge. Yeah. Um, so that's just the general principle. So in terms of learning design, then, the environment has to be modular. Mm. So one, despite, you know, there's a big um, conception that parkour takes, uh, you know, people take part in parkour outdoors and in urban environments, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in uh, North, one of the cities in North Carolina, for instance, they could take part in it or in Sheffield, yeah. you know, jumping rails and stuff. Or in the forest, you know, jumping between barks and, uh, you know, on, on trails and all that sort of stuff. But mm-hmm. one of the key findings uh, that come out of the come out of the interview studies is that a lot of athletes, uh, parkour coaches, uh, sorry, like to coach indoors because mm. they have more control over the environment. Yeah. Uh, and, and not necessarily that it's safe, but it just allows them to, um, you know, create variability. Mm. So that's the that's the that's one key thing. So a modular environment yeah. creates variability because the objects, so in this instance, bars and, and blocks, can be moved between sessions or within mm-hmm. sessions to create new challenges. So it's really bringing out that innovation mm-hmm. in the movement exploration. Um, so just to put a point in there to contrast, you see a lot of these, especially in the UK, there's a, a lot of playgrounds that get developed for yeah. uh, kids play on. And you look at them and they're very symmetrical. Yeah. So for safety reasons. Mm-hmm. But what you find is the symmetrical environments don't have enough variability. Mm. So athletes uh, learn how to uh, negotiate, or athletes or children in this instance, would learn how to move around that playground mm-hmm. 
looks a lot of symmetry. But when it comes to an environment where it's a bit unpredictable, mm-hmm. they, they might not be able to couple uh, you know their actions to react to changes in that environment, whether the surface is wet or you know um, whether something's loose, all that yeah. sort of stuff. Mm, okay. So this is really interesting because this kind of goes back to the concept of like uh, where PE and, and playgrounds were back in, in early, even in um, you know the States, like there used to be a lot more standardized, like PE, kids would do a lot more things, whereas now it's become a lot water, watered down because, like you said, safety reasons. Um, so this is kind of going back to that idea of, of basically play-based learning, and so I really like yeah. that. And so kind of to add to that point, um, what what is the age range here, or what does it look like? Um, could older groups kind of benefit from some of this kind of controlled learning in a, in a parkour environment? Yeah, so we originally um, wrote the article with mm-hmm. like the academy age in mind, so 8 to 12 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the athletic skills model basically proposes a continuum, so how much they have to be exposed to these, or could be exposed to 10 basic movement skills, depending on their age range. Mm-hmm. And like I said, the book's great in outlining that, so... If the listeners at home, you know, I really recommend going and reading this book. It's absolutely brilliant. Mm. But the concepts in terms of skill transfer and, uh, you know, practice design and, mm. you know, exploring an affordance landscape can be applied to um, older groups. Mm. So I'd say it can be applied anything from a young child mm. all the way to uh, an old age pensioner. Mm. And in fact, there's some parkour research uh, out there. I can't, can't recall the name of the researcher that has actually looked at parkour style training. So, um, you know, scaling the movements down in, in elderly populations, mm-hmm. you know, to get, to get them, to get them moving. And, uh, oh, wow. Move. That's, that's really interesting to kind of think about. That's, that's, that's funny. That's not what you yeah. think. That's not the typical population you would think about when, when the word parkour comes up. Yeah. I think what, what's really, what's really interesting about parkour is, and what really separates it from sports like gymnastics is there's no rule based system. Mm. So, Athletes and performers don't have to match certain criteria mm-hmm. in order to move or to, or to uh, complete the complete the, the task. It's parkour mm-hmm. promotes, you know, uh, moving from task A, uh, not task A, point A to point B in the most efficient and effective way possible mm-hmm. through through uh, creative movements and, and so on. Uh, compared to like gymnastics, where, for instance, the pipe movement, the athlete has to get the feet in the right place to score the points. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's so, really interesting. Okay. So in terms of ages, it's universal enough. For, for a six-year-old, it could be um, what's in an academy. It could be you know just getting them to move a little bit, uh, explore the movement mm-hmm. uh, capabilities a little bit better, so they can take on kids who are slightly larger than them mm-hmm. in their age. Um, for a, an elite athlete, it could be you know um, as an donor sport or as an additional activity as a donor sport in the practice to uh, you know develop them physically but also psychologically it might help them manage fear mm. uh, when they're getting knocked down like in rugby for instance or american football and then in the old ages it could be uh, you know some social aspects or mm. you know developing the, the strength capabilities again it's got it's, it's universal and i think that's one thing that really attracts me towards it mm. and uh, yeah I, I can't wait to see the research growing part yeah yeah, that's super interesting. Okay. And then you kind of mentioned the athletic skills model um, a little bit. And so in the article, it kind of mentions um, the 10 basic movement skills. So yeah. would you mind kind of just touching on, if you don't have them handy, just briefly what some of those movement skills are? Yeah, so I have all 10. Oh, uh, excellent. excellent. So uh, we've, we've outlined what the athletic skills model is, haven't we? Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 we have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so 10 basic movement skills. So I'll, I'll mention them quickly and then I'll focus in on some of the ones I find interesting. Okay. So we've got the the 10 basic movement skills, but the group. So balancing and falling, romping and fighting, there's movement, uh, so moving and locomotion, jumping and landing, rolling, tumbling and turning, throwing, catching and hitting, kicking and shooting and aiming, climbing and scrambling, swinging, and probably the most interesting one is music in motion. Mm, okay, yeah. Yeah, let's dive into some of those. Yeah, so let's dive into some of them. So we'll start with music in motion. So, uh, the authors of the book, Randy Vermont and colleagues, basically say that you know you can put music into an environment and get athletes to you know um, sync their uh, limb movement to a rhythm. Mm. So you know, like a beat, da, da, da. You, you see, it, you can see it on, uh, see it when 
people move to a, a metronome or something. Mm-hmm. But one thing our research group uh, interested in is linking that to something called the soft feet analogy. Mm, okay. So in Porto, there's a lot of emphasis on on soft landing. So you know, uh, when we've run some pilot studies before, we've got we've got athletes to really focus on. Uh, reducing the sound uh, when they hit the floor with mm-hmm. the feet, so not a thud. It's you know trying to reduce that as much as possible. Mm. And there's been some research in in parkour uh, by um, by some. I think they're in they're in America. Mm. Uh, what I've looked at the landing kinetics, and they use a um, a device to measure the decibels mm-hmm. of the landing. Yeah, uh, they hypothesise that I think that you know the lower that value is the the less ground reaction force uh, there is, mm. but I'll uh, I'll link you that that in the show notes. Yeah, that that's super interesting because you hear that a lot in coaching of, of uh, you want to absorb it, but at the same time, right, we know that preactivation can also increase, um, like you said, the ground contact time, which can then increase the subsequent movement. So that's kind of interesting yeah. to hear. Yeah, it's um, it's all about you know, um, I suppose really it's it's about becoming fluid. Mm. So yeah, you're being able to couple one movement from another being able to transition from for instance uh, falling and then doing a roll getting mm. up and moving it's mm. that phase transition that we're really interested in yeah um, and you know I'll just focus in on you know balancing and falling so mm. possibly over control yeah that's a big thing in team sports and it's a big thing that parkour develops you know mm. uh, when an athlete's perturbed so disturbed so mm. knocked off balance mm-hmm. you know what do they do to regain that balance and move on to the next movement mm-hmm. yeah yeah I like that. Um, like jump, obviously jumping and landing, being able to you know uh, fly through the air, jump off different heights. That's really just pivotal in parkour. They need that skill. Yeah. And, um, in terms of in terms of landing, mm-hmm. it's needed a lot in contact sports. So in rugby, we're interested in how uh, you know the force can be dissipated uh, across like the rotator cuff. Yeah. Because uh, parkour rules a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're moving within like different axes and planes. You know, it's uh, multi-articular. So you know, you've yeah. got a couple of options from you know, catching, um, catching a catching a ball, putting it towards your chest, rolling mm-hmm. to get it with your opponent, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will you dive into the um, the the fighting one? Oh, so the fighting one. Um, obviously, parkour done. Uh, yeah, not, not too much. Yeah, fight for you from parkour. Uh, but it's just in the book. I mean, I think. I think it's like uh, you know uh, tag games and stuff like that. Oh, okay, so more so, contact type stuff. Like that contact sport. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I think that's based more towards like you know extreme tag, you know, mm. um, bulldog, all that sort of yeah, all that sort of games. Okay. Uh, and just 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 in and on that, uh, you might have seen on YouTube uh, that it makes it makes the rounds on Twitter every every so often. <laughs> okay. Um, but it's a this is a. a, a an activity what's come out i think it actually come out of the united states mm. uh, extreme tag yeah okay yeah you might have seen it and uh, that's really interesting mm-hmm. and that obviously integrates the the one-on-one the contact element you know with yeah. the environment but also trying to get your opponent to tag them out yeah uh, and that's that's one thing that does really interest me i'd like to look at that um uh, in more depth in the future yeah yeah no i really like that okay and so this is kind of a kind of a little bit more um off the cuff concept but so where where does that kind of line or what is the tie between, for example, things like like breakdancing, right, and then and then uh, things like parkour? Because you see a lot of similarities in some of the movements. So just kind of um, based on your opinion, what what do you see that connects those two that can kind of be a benefit? So um, that's really interesting because one of the parkour one of the parkour guys, like mm-hmm. um, uh, is actually quite a good uh, dan- like dance. Yeah, he's got a quite. Quite some quite good moves. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So it, it's the same concept really that we put in the paper. So mm. it's an overlap between the two practice domains. So mm. um, an overlap of affordances, so opportunities for action. Yeah. So for instance, in parkour, the the tic tac movement where they explore, you know, where they jump onto one leg, mm. put all the weight on that, and jump off. You know, in break dancing, that might translate to a hop move. Yeah. Or you know the handstand movement in parkour. Might translate to a handstand movement in in uh, breakdancing. Yeah, it's really it's just it's just um, helping an athlete. You know, taking part in parkour might help an athlete in breakdancing mm-hmm. improve their coordination dynamics, mm-hmm. improve their balance. You know, their postural control. That's that's one thing that's really interesting because you know I've not I've not really thought about that in depth. Mm-hmm. Uh, breakdancing as a donor sport for parkour. Yeah, but that some you know a few avenues that an undergrad out there or, or master student out there might want to. Um, 
might want to look at for the uh, dissertation. That yeah. Would be pretty interesting. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I, I might have to take you up on that. So you might hear from me again soon. So, no. Oh, yeah. Cool. And Definitely. then moving yeah. forward. What's that? I'll be I'll up for a collaboration. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And then kind of moving forward on that, right? So, so a couple questions that kind of dive in a little bit on your thought process and development, right? So what kind of um, has influenced you as far as resources, like whether it's a, a book or a podcast or a conversation with somebody, like what's left the big, biggest influence on your thought process? Okay. Um, that's a good question. And it, um, it really makes me think about the journey I've been on so far. So I'll just outline a few things. So yeah. one of the biggest influences in terms of a book on mm-hmm. my you know, research career today were one by Professor Keith Davis and colleagues. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called The Dynamics of Skill Acquisition. Okay. And uh, this book, you know, it really, it really holds a special place in my uh, art, so to speak. So it got me interested, well, expanded my knowledge base on, you know, contemporary models of skill acquisition. Because mm. up to that, I just learned, you know, the, the traditional approaches like information processing models, you know, schema mm. theory, all that sort of stuff. Mm. I think perhaps most important of all, the resources that I've had, like, the biggest inspiration or impact on me is my PhD team, mm. you know, my supervisory team. Uh, you know, Dr. Joe Stone, Professor Keith Davis, and uh, Dr. Jamie North. So, uh, Joe's been an excellent, you know, resource and a mentor to me so far. I first met him when I was an undergrad student, mm. fresh faced in 2015. <laughs> and he talked to me about his PhD, and I, I, you know, I just thought, wow, you know, contemporary motor control, mm. I absolutely love this. You know, I really want to carry it forward. Yeah. And he just provided me with loads of loads of opportunities, and you know, you know, it means it means a lot to me. And, no, thanks for that, Joe. Mm. And then I met Jamie through Jamie North through uh, Joe Stone because he was Joe Stone's uh, supervisor on his PhD. Mm. Okay. Uh, Joe, director studies, uh, and you know, Keith da- like Professor Keith Davis. What can I say? Um, <laughs> he's been an absolute, you know, great mentor and resource for me. You know, give me loads of opportunities and really taught me how to how to research and how to mm. write a research paper. Yeah. Was a uh, first. I first. The, how I met Keith is a, is a story in itself. Basically, I was doing a, a work placement, and I met a lad called Charlie, mm-hmm. and got talking to him. And uh, he said, "I'm over from Australia." Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I'm, I've got, I'm, I went, "Oh yeah, so you're staying, you know, Airbnb or something, you know?" He says, "No, I'm staying at my parents' house, and my dad works here." And I'm like, "Oh, that's good." I went, Who, "Who's your dad?" He went, "Keith Davis." And honestly, <laughs> I was starstruck for. Keith Davis works at Sheffield Allen, and I didn't know anyway, so I, asked, yeah. I went to ask Joe Stone uh, about it. Yeah. And uh, he said, yeah, Keith works here. Uh, let me put you in contact with him. Uh-huh. So I, I had a meeting, and before it, I was like shaking. I was like, oh, I'm so nervous to meet Keith, because like, he's like your hero. You read about it and yeah. read all his research. And, uh, yeah, ever since meeting him, he's just been great, you know. Yeah, he excellent. Made me into the re- molded me into the researcher I am today, and I'm yeah. truly grateful for that. I love that. Okay. And then kind of moving forward a little bit into this very last segment, right? Um, a few rapid fire questions. So if you have any, what are some quotes that you kind of live by? Oh, excellent question. <laughs> awesome. So uh, I've got two quotes. Okay. And uh, one's probably, you know, a little more generic. Yeah. So it's called by Albert Einstein. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so it is a person who never made a mistake, never tried anything new, mm. which is really good. And it fits to our theoretical approach, you know. Yeah. Uh, Repetition without repetition, all that sort of stuff. And then uh, one's by the lead singer of a band called the Arctic Monkeys. Okay. Which off from Sheffield, Alex Turner. Uh, and in one of their first songs, they said, uh, before they started singing it on the music video, don't believe the hype. Mm. Okay. So it means, uh, you know, don't get ahead of yourself. Don't yeah. believe, you know, if, uh, you know, don't be negative. You yeah. Do your own thing. Carry on. Yeah. Moving forward. I like it. Uh, Okay, yeah. and then kind of moving forward a little bit, is there a thought or experience from your past that you've kind of held on to that has made a big difference in your life now? Uh, I think just going back to what I said before about meeting uh, Professor Keith Davis, mm. I think that's that experience really you know, focused my mind into wanting to pursue a career in, in research and mm-hmm. doing a PhD in school acquisition. And, and, and thankfully, I've been able to uh, stay at Sheffield Hallam and do a, a PhD under his supervision and guidance. Mm. Okay, and then... That leads me to kind of my next question. What is the best advice you've ever been given? Um, so this might sound uh, a little bit cliche, but uh, I can't remember who said this to me, but you can always edit a bad page. Mm-hmm. 
you can never edit an empty page. So mm. keep right. I like that. Okay. That applies to, I think, a lot of people. So I, I really like that one. Cool. Yeah. And then in contrast to that, what's the worst advice you've ever been given? Uh, know your limits. Because how do you know your limits if you've not got to the final destination yet? Mm, okay. You got some good ones. You were prepared for this. Yeah. Most should people... make some t-shirts, shouldn't I? Yeah, you really should. I like that. Okay. So last question here. Um, what You kind of mentioned a little bit, but what kind of projects are you currently working on and how can people reach out to you and follow your journey? So uh, to start, so to reach out to me, I have Twitter, uh, B.W. Strafford. So uh, it's B.W. and then S-T-R-A-F-F-O-R-D. Okay. And you can also follow the Caesar Twitter account. So it's uh, C-S-E-R. Or alternatively, you can drop me an email mm. on b.strafford at shoe.ac.uk. Mm. Okay. And if any new papers come out, drop me an email. Yeah. Uh, like I've published, and I'll, I'll shoot you. A, I'll happy to shoot you a, a copy across. Um, anytime. So in terms of the projects I'm working on, mm-hmm. um, so I'm trying to really run some, uh, you know, lab studies to substantiate some of the ideas we put in both of these papers. Mm-hmm. So looking at, you know. Um, how we can design parkour environments, how we can integrate them into practice, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, scale, scaling some of the movements by looking at coordination dynamics between uh, parkour athletes and team sports. Mm. Uh, yes, I'm running some of them, starting to run some of them in the summer, and okay. hopefully papers will be out within the next year or so, but you know what research is like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I always got to plan. Yeah, most definitely. Excellent. Well, yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. Feel, free to, uh, feel free to shoot me an email if you've got any questions or, yeah. you know, yeah. want further details Fan- on what I said today. Fantastic. Well, Ben, this has been awesome. Um, this is kind of a very unique conversation, one that I haven't had, nor did I even really think I was going to have. So I really appreciate your time no and your worries. insight. Um, and then, yeah, if you just go ahead and send those articles, I'll, I'll link them in the show notes. And then uh, yeah. uh, other than that, thank you so much for your time. And I really hope we can connect again soon in the future. No worries. Awesome. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your time.